Hi everybody, welcome to the Vazen 40mm 1.8x Anamorphic Review Part 2. This time we are going to be looking at actual practical tests. I personally shot a few tests out in the open and Marcus actually shot a short film with actors produced. So let's go right into it. Let's say hi to Marcus. How are you doing over on your end in Fullerton? Just trying to stay cool. It's just really hot over here. Oh yeah, man, this garage, man. You're gonna see armpit sweat in just a second. As you can see here, it's $3,250 off of B&H. Uh, definitely check out the link that we have in the description below to learn more about it. So it is uh, priced to own. All right, but we're gonna go straight into some examples okay. that we filmed out and opened and we go straight into it. And I'm gonna start with what everybody came here for which is flares. Let's take a look at the nighttime test that I did. All right, so as you can see here, this is a street light. It's a little bit hard to see if your contrast uh, is high on your monitor. Uh, raising the ISO actually makes that flare even more obvious. You know, just kind of boosts the midtones a little bit, the shadows. Now, if you have soft lights uh, kind of in a distance, diffuse lighting, it's, it's not gonna do a whole lot in terms of flares. You might get a little bit more, as you can see on those lights on the right. Uh, uh, especially when you boost it to as high as 3200. Here's a thousand eyes, so it's okay. When you get more under those lights that are casting down, uh, pointing up, yeah, of course, you'll get flare. Uh, these soft lights over here, you get kind of a hazy flare. But overall, it is super duper easy to get flare with this shot here. So just shooting a basketball game with lights that aren't necessarily in your face, it's amazingly easy to get a streak one of those sexy J.J. Abrams streaks. And here's my car. Uh, unfortunately, I'm revealing my license plate, I guess. But dude, when you do get direct in your lighting, it is, oh my goodness. It's it's like an orgy of streaking, don't you think? And um, yeah, I just wanted to get a car passing by. I felt a little shy because like, I hope he doesn't stop and you know start saying, you're, you're like trampling on my privacy. And then uh, here's the oval bulkhead, just defocusing as a bike goes by. I'm also glad that he was not too pissed off about that. And then here's just defocusing as a got junk car uh, goes on as well. I love this thing. This, uh, especially with the bulkhead in nighttime, it's I, I think it's just mm, perfecto. But speaking of flares and character, let's take a look at shooting into the sun with these sun flare tests, yeah? So this is a uh, shooting straight into the sun at the park that's right out there. This is actually kind of a hazy day, so this is not really the perfect um, example of a super sharp pinpoint sun source. You know, panning back and forth, doing a little bit of tilting, you get that nice, you know, little fragmented streak. You know, there's a straight line, There's uh, then there's the fragmentation of those little uh, rectangles uh, that are a you know an artifact of both the squeeze element of the and the different elements within the lens kind of bouncing around which uh, gives it that kind of little something something now where the flare actually really shines is you know when you have a backlit object or a mountain or something for that streak to go across and um, I think I think this looks great you know um, it's not like too insane of a flare that it overcomes the whole image. You know, you can still focus on the uh, scene at hand, but it's kind of like, ooh, that's a bit of sexiness to the shot, yeah. Yeah, there was one shot in, a, in our short film where I did have the light kind of right behind our actor and it did kind of cover up his whole entire face. And I ended up scrapping that and redoing the shot and moving the light around. I guess it depends on the light source because the, the light I had, it went like the entire kind of length of his face. That's a, actually a really good point because in order to get the, the perfect flare that isn't too distracting, you can't have like panel. For that perfect flare, you need something like a flashlight that has just the you know crew members going like this with or, or like a Fresnel style light. One last thing before we get to Marcus's examples, uh, including his short film, is my daughter. And I wanted to uh, channel my inner Emmanuel Lubezki. I'm gonna lower the volume of that over dramatic music just so you can hear us. So uh, essentially this is uh, my daughter like falling down constantly in uneven grass and mommy picking her up. There is a little bit of stabilization because I was so high shutter speed and it was handheld. 
Uh, but you know that picking up action is uh, perfect to you know do a little Emmanuel Lebesky thing here. It also slightly reminds me of you know uh, uh, what is what you call it? Um, I forgot the movie's name, but Amy Adams. I don't know, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm an expert on movies, aren't I? But look at that streak. <laughs> just look at that streak. Yeah. I'll stop talking. Just yeah, look at that streak. That's the streak I was talking about. It's like nice and thin. So if you're using a light panel, exactly what you were saying, it, it just is too, it doesn't look as nice. So you need a yeah. Fresnel or the sun. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the amazing thing about, yeah, using the sun is that it's, it's so like pinpointing and natural. Uh, of course, how do you like not use some shots that are just going right across her face? because it became too overbearing. But just look at this. I, I mean, sunset shots are baller with this thing. Arrival, <laughs> yes, fan pay, thank you, Arrival. There's a lot of like bat lit, bat, backlit shots in Arrival and, uh, you know, in slow-mo, kid, and you know, those kind of flash forwards, flash back stuff. Oh, did I give it a spoiler? But just, ah, oh, it's amazing, you know? Uh, I would love to just keep every single anamorphic lens out there, damn it, because I'm like, Oh man, this is instant sexiness to all my films. Uh, enough of me. Let's take a look at what Marcus did with uh, this lens. Uh, first of all, with uh, his little trip to Palm Springs. We just went to the uh, top of a hill and kind of shot some stuff. So it was pretty windy. It was all handheld. Um, so that's why it's a little bouncy, but I think it looks nice. Yeah, this is all in 60p, right? This is all slow motion uh, in 60p. And yeah, I thought the windmills would be a cool subject to, to film. And it's, you know, it's obviously like a, you know, wide landscape kind of shot that you can kind of get it's like an epic feel. So it's an epic anamorphic frame for epic. It shows that 40 millimeters is actually uh, decently versatile. You're not going to get super wide, uh, but it, it's great for like uh, filming people as well as uh, a lot of like location shots. So um, the 28 millimeter would be appreciated to get some establishing shots, you know. I, I think the 40 millimeter is a must have. Uh, it's not completely wide, but you can still get wide shots, as you can see. Um, I think 28 millimeter in that same position would be, I don't know, it would be really epic. Please uh, give us your little introduction to the short film that you guys all came together to create. So this short film was uh, written by my roommate, Tom, my girlfriend, Emily, myself and Tom all shot it inside our condo and starred in it. So don't judge our acting too much. Kind of just try to focus on the story. I didn't try to focus on the lens too much. Um, and it really didn't get in the way at all. So the only issue that I had is that uh, the focus ring. 300 degrees of throw. It's insane. Yeah, 300, yeah, 300 throw. I mean, that's great in normal circumstances, but when I'm shooting by myself, it's kind of hard to, it's very difficult to, to do that um, as a one-man operator. Dude, that thing you got to spend forever to pull, even with the follow focus. It's like, yeah. <laughs> so when you do a push it's like. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, without further ado, let's, um, uh, what's the title of the movie again? Uh, Trouble at Home. Hey, sweetie. Oh, it's fine. It's all right. It's okay. What's up? Are you okay? I can't come home right now. I'm at work. Okay. I'll be right there. Okay, what's wrong? Okay, wait. What is this? All right, what's going on? 
Okay. I'll tell you, but I need you to not react, okay? I think we should call Dr. Martin. Put it down. Remember that guy from last night? You mean the guy you flirted with? Yeah. You know, I thought I left my purse at the bar and I was gonna go after work today to pick it up. But then I got a text from, from... Nora, just say it. From the guy. That guy? Yeah, he, he texted me. He said he had my purse and to meet him at the park so I could pick it up. But I was about to leave. What happened? He grabbed me. Are you okay? I'm fine, just come with me. So, what should we do? Did you get your purse? Marcus was the bad guy. Marcus was a bad guy oh, and did body. Was. That, was, that was pretty fun. <laughs> I was trying to maximize the time I spent behind the camera. So that was like one quick, like a few quick shots of me and then I'm behind the camera for the rest. What benefits, so what was different, you know, about filming a much more story-based film uh, that didn't, you know, go crazy on J.J. Abrams' anamorphic effects? It's more of a dramatic feel. So with a dramatic story, I think it kind of added to it. It's not like you're going to film a comedy in anamorphic, you know? Uh, did you feel like cropping, uh, you know, a 16 by 9 image down would have been enough? Yeah, to be 100% honest, the story didn't need anamorphic, but it adds a, a dramatic flair to it. Um, but it definitely didn't need it. Like, we could have done this without it. It depends on whether it's appropriate for the story, in which case uh, I think you were just telling me that um, yeah, there was uh, too too much flair for the story. There was the one profile shot of Tom and I originally had the light too low and then there was a streak going across his face. It's like, so we had to reshoot that and raise the light a little bit higher. So it was kind of like, so there's no flair coming in. Yeah, I, I would say the, the use cases that I would use it in are, are kind of like, you know, lifestyle commercials and such. Marcus, yeah. well, who would you recommend this for and recommend it against? <laughs> well, yeah, definitely not for documentary films. But yeah, I think it's mostly for narrative work commercials. So I think it was a great lens. It was, it was wonderful to use because we were kind of complaining about the close focus kind of being an issue or potentially an issue. It was only an issue for me uh, for one shot in the short film, and that's just a close up on the phone. You can, I couldn't get as close as I wanted to. The, I think the, the main issue for me is not necessarily framing so much, but trying to get maximum bokeh. I looked into diopters, and I think that would solve people's problems. It might add a little bit more uh, character. Uh, the one recommended by Vazen that they said that users had the best experience with is the Vivitar series. I guess closing comments for me is that I would love to own this lens. So I think it's legit. I think it's uh, great. And, any stylistic filmmakers toolkit. All right guys, we're coming out with a whole lot more reviews on cameras, lenses, and overall filmmaking gear. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell. We're doing a lot of live tapings these days and which is interactive for you to ask questions and such. So make sure to look through what events are coming up and set the reminders. So see you guys next time and happy nerding out there.